happy Tuesday, everybody. So, I uh, don't know if I'm officially back to making videos again, uh, but I am on vacation until September 9th, so I thought that I would get on here and do a video, see how it turns out. Haven't done it in a while, and um, it's not that I've lost passion for doing it, it's just life gets so busy and then you just you don't have time to do something that is more like a hobby right now which I would like it to be more than a hobby but for now that's what it is so I'll take what I can get when I've got the time to do it so I just had a few articles that I had found um, in a video that I wanted to take a look at um, the first one it's a video and it's from Louder with Crowder and it says uh, watching this pro Hamas protester gets snatched by cops mid-sentence is the funniest video you'll see this week. So I thought we'd do something funny and lighthearted. Um, it says, this is by Broad again. There are days when one F's around, you know, you know, what is that? Uh, Fafo? Anyway, there are days when one finds out. And on those days when one finds out, please have your smartphone handy because these videos are like content from heaven. Yesterday, cops snatched a pro-Hamas protester mid-sentence, and the over-under for how many times you'll watch it over and over again in one sitting is 37. Now, this is from June 12th. The location is UCLA, as we've seen every day since October 8th on college campuses that aren't across America as much as they are located in cities run by progressives. The future Democrat staffers of America have been protesting on behalf of Hamas, or as they call it, Free Palestine. So when Joe Biden says they are very fine people on both sides, these are some of the very fine people he is talking about. Okay, so let's take a look at this video. These, are, these people are crazy. Truthfully, they're crazy. I guess this is the vice chancellor. You're not safe! 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 So I guess that's the vice chancellor. Um, anyway, so the Chabad rabbi of UCLA was just physically assaulted live on camera. The student subsequently began calling him a Zionist pedophile rabbi, telling him to go back to Poland. We are in such a dark, dangerous time in our country with almost no leadership fighting back. Do I talk some about something? Tell me how much you love America, maybe. Come on. Rabbi. I'm gonna make that fucking phone disappear. Uh huh. Sure. Back off. Back I'm off. Not you, so don't yeah, you're assaulting me. Pedophile. You threat. How? You threaten how? me. How the fuck I threaten you? You know what assault how? means? How? How? Assault how? means you're threatening how? me. How? You're threatening me, you? and you're live right now. Oh, well, of course. You better watch it. Back off. Back off. Back off. Back off. Don't put your hands on him. Back off. Back up. Why don't you show your face, bright, brave man? Yeah, of course. They don't show their face because they don't want people Why to know that they're associated with it. Back up. Back up. You fucking touch me, you're going to pass the fuck out. Something tells me the reason they don't want their face shown is because they know it's not a great cause and they don't want to be associated with it um, when it eventually it, you know, backfires on them. So, those videos set the stage for the pro-Hamas protest at UCLA police were sent to. These progressives, same as the ones Joe Biden panders to because if not, he'll lose Michigan, had ample effing around time, then came to find out. Or as one protester so eloquently put it, I just want to say, ah! Okay. So, it says this video needs to be in dictionary t next to the word FAFO. Um, also, follow at the... Stu Stu Studio. I grab his videos all the time. Great follow. Okay, and that's from Ron M. Let's check it out. No racist police! No racist police! I just want to say. Fuck you! 
I'm not really sure why they grabbed her, though. What did she do? All right, let's, let's go back. Let's see exactly what she did. Other than maybe they're not supposed to be there, but I can't figure out what she did wrong other than talking. I thought we were allowed to protest as long as we were peacefully doing so. Is this a different angle? Let's see. Oh, no, this is going to take you to his Twitter. So it's unclear why she was snatched. I don't think it's illegal in California to be an obnoxious twat. It's not like she drove over a rainbow flag painted on the street where people do things like drive cars. She was repeating Democrat Party talking points through a megaphone. As long as you repeat Democrat Party talking points, especially in states like California, you have the immunity to do anything. Maybe they can find 34 bookkeeping errors she made and charge her with those. Authorities can work out the details of what's legal and what's illegal. I've only gathered you all here together to laugh at her. You make a mince, you're laughing. Um, it's really hard for me. I, God, I don't like these people. I cannot stand them. But she wasn't actually doing anything. So I can't condone the police doing that to her. And that's what makes the police look bad. I understand they're frustrated and they're tired of it and they just want it to stop and people to be normal. But you make yourself look bad when you just snatch somebody like that just because they're about to, they're calling you racist. It's a bad look for the police, truthfully. Now, moving on from that. Uh, Kamala Harris surrogate wishes for something heinous to happen to J.D. Vance's daughter, on MSNBC, and this is by Danielle Bergikian. Oh gosh, it's probably way off, sorry. And this was from August 20th. Now, um, I do not condone saying you want things to happen to a politician's family members like they used to do with Barron. It's terrible. So it says, the left glorifies abortion and loathes those who dare to disagree with them as they deny that killing unborn children is unjustifiable. Subsequently, rare is no longer what they want as they demand abortions take place all day, every day. Despite this, it's still not every day that a leftist goes on TV to wish rape upon the kids of their political opponents as that is even something reprehensible for the left. But Andy Bashir sees no issue with that, which is why he disgustingly called for J.D. Vance's daughter to be raped. Now, speaking of they want abortions to take place all day, every day. Did anybody hear that at the DNC, they had like a mobile abortion clinic and vasectomy clinic to do abortions and vasectomies right outside the DNC? Crazy people. Disgusting people. So, J.D. Vance says, what the heck is this? Why is Andy Bashir KY wishing that a member of my family would get raped? What a disgusting person. So let's watch the video and make sure that we have the context. Okay, of course it's gonna take us to Twitter, but that's fine, we'll watch it here. But what, what some people have had to go through because of these laws, uh, I mean, Janie Vance calls pregnancy resulting from rape inconvenient. Like inconvenience wow. is traffic. I mean, it is, it, make him go through this. I mean, think about what, what some people have had to go through because of well, okay, so putting it in context, it, it's a little different. He didn't specifically say, you know, let his daughter get raped and get pregnant. I know that's what he's alluding to, absolutely. But I don't want to be like the left. So um, I, I, I don't think he meant that in a malicious way, and I'm giving a lot of grace when I say that. I really don't. I think he, he really believes what he's saying um, about abortion for a rape victim. And I think he was just saying, you know, put yourself in that person's shoes. You know, how would you feel? You know, so I, I don't know necessarily if that was malicious. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm giving away too much grace, like I said. Um, to say that is morally deranged and evil would be an understatement. So the Democratic governor's comments came during an appearance on NBC um, when he said that rape is in uh, pregnancy from rape is inconvenient. He said... I mean, it is a make him go through this. It is someone being violated, someone being harmed, and then telling them that they don't have options after that. So, see, it actually didn't show that whole thing. 
So, because um, he didn't say all this. He just said, make him go through this. And then the video cuts off. So you may be asking what Kamis Bashir is referring to that would cause him to wish such an evil act on a child. Well, Vance dared to claim that he prioritized the lives of babies. So he's referring to a 2021 interview when he was a then Senate candidate. And he said that pregnancy due to rape or incest is inconvenient. Quote, my view on this has been very clear, and I think the question portrays a certain presumption that is wrong. Uh, this is what he said in 2021. Quote, it's not whether a woman should be forced to bring a child to term. It's whether a child should be allowed to live, even though the circumstances of that child's birth are somehow inconvenient or a problem to the society. The question really to me is about the baby. And I agree with him. Why should the child pay for the sins of what the father did? The child did nothing wrong. It isn't something that you just go kill this baby because you were raped. And I understand that being raped is a terrible thing and it's life changing. And I know it can throw you into depression and all kinds of mental state that you can get into. Believe me, I know. I know. 2019, I know. Now, I halfway know. So I understand it, and I understand what it can do to your mind. I do. And to carry a baby and birth that child knowing that you were raped, I, I'm, I know it could probably keep you from loving that child. I think that's just from the mental state that you're in because there have been women who were raped and got pregnant, had their child, and they love them, and they care for them because they separate what this man did to them that was so evil but they got this blessing out of it and that's what i say that child is still a blessing no matter how they were conceived period so the reason why he was so triggered by those comments is because the democratic party is literally a death cult and children are almost always bearing the burden of their progressive social experiments all that is evil enough, but does not even come close to wishing the worst crime against a child and all because you disagree with someone. Vance never said rape was an inconvenience and this man is either intentionally misrepresenting him or too stupid to understand basic sentences. And yes, both can be true. So uh, that's what J.D. Vance is dealing with. I, I don't know much about J.D. Vance. Uh, I I need to see more of what he's like and what he's going to do and, and research him more. I don't know enough. So I'm not going to really say much other than I really enjoyed what he said when he was on Tucker Carlson and said that the country is run by single cat ladies and they're despicable people. Um, news update for anybody who likes motorcycles. Hardly Davidson has gone woke, so don't buy those anymore. I don't think I'm going to read the whole article here, but this is from Danielle Bergikian. Bur Bergikian, that sounds better, uh, from July 25th, saying that um, there is no reason Hardly Davidson should be incorporating racist DEI initiatives and holding gay boot camps, especially because they sell motorcycles. But the people in charge refuse to read the room and the anti-woke mob may or may not start doing its thing. So it's probably one of the last companies you would expect to jump on the woke bandwagon. But just like how Bud Light and Tractor Supply don't care about funding things and movements that despise the majority of their consumer base, the same holds for Harley. So Robbie Starbuck put out it's time to expose Harley Davidson. It has been one of the most beloved brands in America, but recently... Uh, CEO Jockin Zeitz watch they have gone totally woke here's some of what we found they openly support the Equality Act let me get this pulled up which allowed men into girls bathrooms and uh, sports and locker rooms HD funded an all ages pride event that featured a rage room next to drag queen story time 1800 employees had to do virtual training on how to become LGBTQ plus allies Founding member of Wisconsin's LGBTQ plus Chamber of Commerce, this chamber opposed a law that would have banned sex changes for kids in Wisconsin on behalf of the businesses they represent, including Harley Davidson. Sponsored LGBTQ plus entrepreneur boot camp, the woke CEO Jock and Zeit signed the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion pledge. 
made February and March months of inclusion because apparently Pride Month isn't enough. Multiple woke United Way trainings. Donated millions to United Way who made the United for Equity program where they promote Ibram Kendi, the woke children's book, Anti-Racist Baby, Awake to Woke to Work, a podcast on the concept of whiteness, woke activist Robin DiAngelo, bigotry against Christians who supposedly have Christian privilege, and more. Sent some white male employees to a white male only woke diversity training program. HD is openly working to have less white suppliers, dealers, and employees. They are partners with the yearly Pride Ride. They support the Pennsylvania Youth Congress who help create gender neutral licenses in Pittsburgh. Partnered with the far left HRC group to support LGBTQ plus causes. Hosted LGBTQ plus events at the corporate office. They celebrated their legal department taking a woke 21 day racial equity and literacy challenge, which included speeches like Black Panthers, White Lies, a BLM speech, and Taneshi Coates, Case for Reparations, LGBTQ plus and race based identity ERG groups at HD, a total commitment to DEI policies. Good lord. I don't know if I can read all this. Um, well, we're almost done. 90 out of 100 CEI score from the HRC. To put it mildly, Harley Davidson seems to have forgotten who their core customers are. I don't think the values at corporate reflect the values of nearly any Harley Davidson bikers. Do Harley riders want the money they spend at Harley to be used later by corporate to push an ideology that's diametrically opposed to their own values? So, um, if you don't want to, you can call the Harley Davidson customer care number here, um, 800-258-2464 or 414-343-4056. And you can also email corporate at um, media at harley-davidson.com. So, there you go. They have gone woke for sure. I didn't know they'd already done all that. So this this has been going on much longer than what we're just now talking about in July. So we should have known about that sooner. Now, let me get rid of this. We're going to move into more serious stuff here. I need to get a drink. This is about illegal immigrants. And this one's from Blaze Media. And it says... Um, previously deported illegal alien stabs teen girl at a baseball game in the random attack. Now this happened. Well, that can't be true. We haven't reached September. Oh, yeah, we have. Oh my goodness. I should probably edit that out. <laughs> um, my bad. That was yesterday. Good grief. So... An illegal immigrant was arrested on Sunday afternoon after he was accused of randomly attacking a 14-year-old girl at a baseball game in Lowell, Indiana. The Lake County Sheriff's Department apprehended 26-year-old Demas Gabriel Yanez over the weekend after an extensive manhunt. And that's from WMAQ-TV. So, early Sunday morning, a teenage girl attending her brother's baseball game was allegedly stabbed by Gabriel Yanez. The suspect also reportedly attempted to stab the teenager's mother when she tried to intervene in the assault. Matthew Ram uh, Ramian, the coach of the baseball team that was playing when the stabbing occurred, told WLS-TV, quote, He just jumped on her and pushed her over, smashed her umbrella over, and then proceeded to pull out what I called a bowie knife, or like a big 16 to 18 inch knife, and just started swinging it on her. End quote. So, according to him, several fathers attending the game chased after the suspect who fled on foot following the stabbing. However, they lost track on him. Good for those fathers. Good on them for being brave enough to go and search out this person. I mean, of course, there's multiple on one, but still, there's some men out there that would not do that. The Sheriff's Department stated that the suspect ran into a wooded area behind a residential community. Multiple agencies aided in the manhunt, which included canine and aviation units. Law enforcement officials ultimately located the suspect in a cornfield and placed him under arrest. Authorities believe that right before his arrest, he attempted to cut his hair to change his appearance. Now, she did sustain injuries to her hand and was treated at a hospital before being released the following day. No other injuries were reported as a result of the random violent attack. So, at least it was very, very minor. He wasn't able to do as much because of people intervening. So Gabriel Yanez, a Honduran national, was previously deported from the U.S. in 2018. He later re-entered the country illegally. 
Law enforcement officials believe he may have been involved in other criminal activity across the U.S. since he unla unlawfully returned. Well, duh, of course he has. Local authorities notified the U.S. Department of Homeland Security about the arrest. So, Indiana Attorney General Todd Rakita, Republican, who's been tough on illegal immigration matters, has filed lawsuits against nearby sanctuary jurisdictions for providing a, quote, safe harbor to illegal aliens against state law, end quote. In one of those jurisdictions, East Chicago repealed its quote-unquote welcoming city ordinance in response to the AG's legal action. Rakita called it a quote, big win for hard-working Hoosiers and legal immigrants who came to our great nation the right way, end quote. But that's not all, because this leads in to the next article from the Daily Wire, where 70, around 75% of violent crime arrests in Midtown Manhattan are suspected illegal immigrants. Now, this one is by Zach Jewell. Did I say who the other one was by? I'm so sorry. Candace Hathaway. So, this one is by Zach Jewell, and this was from today, September 3rd. So, three out of every four people arrested for crimes such as assault, domestic violence, and robbery in Midtown Manhattan are suspected of being in the U.S. illegally, police sources told the New York Post. The Post reported that New York Police Department officers are working at a disadvantage when they arrest suspected illegal immigrants as the Big Apple's quote-unquote sanctuary city laws do not allow for cooperation with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. So police sources in Queens estimate that more than 60% of those arrested for assault, domestic violence, and robbery are suspected illegal immigrants. Quote, New York City eliminated a toll to get rid of violent criminals. What a mess. Now, this is from the former prosecutor at the Queens District Attorney's Office, Jim Quinn. He also said that, quote, the sanctuary city law is pathetic, it's disgusting, and it's crazy, end quote. You know, back when Rudy Giuliani was there, it was a much better state. Last week, Democrat New York City Mayor Eric Adams defended the city, taking in tens of thousands of illegal immigrants, and said it's up to the city council to revise sanctuary city laws. He added that he believes migrants, quote, who commit violent acts, end quote, should be deported after serving time behind bars. No, just deport them, because then we're still taking care of these people with our tax dollars. Just deport them. Or unalive them. Perfectly fine with that, too, if it, they kill somebody. Just unalive them. Quote, I've been extremely clear that the overwhelming number of migrants and asylum seekers and undocumented immigrants that come here, their goal is to pursue the American dream. No, it's not. That is not their goal. Their goal is to take advantage of the systems that we have in place to help our people that we just willy-nilly hand out freely to these people and we support them. He also said that migrants and asylum seekers are paroled into our city into our country, so they're here legally. But those who commit violent acts after they serve their time, I think they should be removed from our country. But they're not here legally. These people are not here legally. They're not asylum seekers. That's what drives me nuts about these people. And you know that they're being disingenuous and that they don't actually believe what they're saying. Um, so also, right now, we don't have the authorization to be able to go and coordinate with ICE. We have to follow the law. That blows my mind that a state can override federal law that people can't illegally enter the country. I don't understand that. Okay. So, an NYPD spokesman told the Post, quote, Police officers are prohibited from asking about the immigration status of crime victims, witnesses, or suspects, and therefore the NYPD doesn't track data pertaining to immigration statuses. Well, duh. Because they don't want the people to know that it's the illegal immigrants committing all these crimes. So we can't track it. They also said despite the lack of concrete statistics on migrant crime in New York City, law enforcement officers said that they often, quote, have so many migrant cases we have to call in for extra Spanish interpreters, end quote. That gives you your idea. It may not be proof proof, but it's a speculation that if they don't speak English, they're probably illegal immigrants here. So, come on Mondays, almost every case is a migrant, one court officer said. 
So in June, an illegal immigrant was arrested for allegedly tying up and raping a 13-year-old girl in a Queens Park in broad daylight. Christian Giovanni Ingalandi, 25, was nabbed after a group of Good Samaritans recognized him from posters and held him down until police arrived. Since the spring of 2022, around 210,000 illegal immigrants have arrived in New York City. The migrant crisis is estimated to cost the city $10 billion every three years. It's nuts. It is so crazy. They are doing everything they can from within to destroy this country and tear it down. And here's the big problem. And I think this could lead into the next one. Okay. From Blaze Media. And this is by, um, it's a lifestyle uh, article. Couldn't think of the word. So, I wanted to talk about this because I think this is a big deal. Now, if you follow Mr. Reagan on Twitter, he did repost a picture. And um, maybe maybe I can get to it. Hang on. He reposted a picture that's, that a lady shared. So this is a map of all the churches in France that have burned down over the past four years. That's a lot of churches. Now let's get back to uh, this article. Blaze News investigates American dechristianization, why it's happening, and what it will mean for the Republic. This is by Joseph McKinnon, and this is from September 1st. So, and I think this is important. Because, as you know, this country was founded on the foundation of the Bible and Christian values. And I do not say Judeo-Christian values because it had nothing to do with Jewish values. It was Christian values. Okay. And that's not saying anything about the Jews. I support Israel and I back them 100%. You will never find me not backing Israel for any reason. I will always back them because God says, if you bless my people, I will bless you. If you curse my people, I will curse you. I'm blessing Israel. But America was not found on Judeo-Christian values. It was Christian. Anyway, so it says, America appears to be fast undergoing a process of de-Christianization. This phenomenon will have profound social, spiritual, political, and legal implications for the country. Scholars and others who have investigated various aspects of American disenchantment and religious disaffiliation have provided Blaze News with, a pen, with penetrating insights into what is taking place, what is driving or at the very least exacerbating this trend, and what consequences lie in wait for an unchristian America. Barring some miraculous revival or generational reversal, it appears that radical transformation may leave it unrecognizable and worse for wear. So, some scenario modeling has indicated that the number of Americans of all ages who are Christian may shrink significantly over the next few decades, from what is presently less than 65% to as little as one-third of the population by 2070, assuming that many of the mainline and evangelical churches will continue losing followers to the ranks of the religiously unaffiliated. The Public Religion Research Institute published the results of a survey for over 5,600 American adults earlier this year indicating, quote, this is from the study, around one quarter of Americans or 26% identify as religiously unaffiliated in 2023, a five percentage point increase from 20%, 21% in 2013, and nearly one in five Americans or 18% left a religious tradition to become religiously unaffiliated, over one third of whom were pre previously Catholic, 35%, and mainline slash non-evangelical Protestant, 35%. I do want to make clear that a lot of people, though, that identify as Christian, they're cultural Christians. I don't believe that they're true, born-again, saved-by-grace Christians. So the Pew Research Center indicated last year that roughly 28% of American adults fall into the unaffiliated camp populated by agnostics, atheists, and nothings in particular, a cohort referred to as nuns. Around the same time, Gallup found that only 45% of respondents would say religion is, in their own lives, very important. When Gallup asked Americans this question in 1965, 70% said religion was, religion was very important. Church attendance and church membership among Americans also appear to have dropped precipitously in recent decades. Between 1940 and 2000, the percentage of respondents who told Gallup they belonged to a formal house of worship bounced around 70%, 70 and then took a nosedive following the advent of the new millennium. 45% of respondents told Gallup last year that they belonged to a church. Now, 
the U.S. has seen many a boom and bust in Christian religiosity. Despite many betting against its return, including Thomas Jefferson, who figured traditional Christianity for worm food, the faith has repeatedly found its way out of the grave and into a new era of packed churches. That's because God's word is everlasting and endureth forever. There is, however, something anomalous and possibly cataclysmic about this current bust that is even longtime critics contemplating what civilizational blessings will be lost along with Christianity as the dominant religion and what ultimately will become of civilization should the fate foretold come to fruition. Shortly after British atheist Richard Dawkins admitted that, quote, it would be truly dreadful, end quote, to replace Christianity with any other religion and for his country to lose its, quote, beautiful parish churches, end quote. Derek Thompson, a self-identified agnostic at the Atlantic, said of the PRRI survey results, quote, I wonder if, in foregoing organized religion, an isolated country has discarded an old and proven source of ritual at a time when we most need it, end quote. Thompson then added, quote, it took decades for Americans to lose religion. It might take decades to understand the entirety of what we lost, end quote. While America is already losing beautiful parish churches, it is not altogether clear what else this isolated country stands to lose should the disaffiliation highlighted in recent polling data continue and Christianity shrink as a cultural, political, and spiritual force within its borders. So this title was Heretical Christianity's sacrifice regime. So Dr. Joshua Mitchell is a professor of political theory at Georgetown University where he also served as chairman of the government department. He's the author of several books including American Awakening, Identity Politics, and Other Afflictions of Our Time. So when he was asked uh, by Blaze News whether Christianity is actually in decline or whether something else is afoot, Mitchell indicated that what may appear in the polls is better understood as a kind of heresy. Quote, the churches gave up on that difficult combination of God's judgment and God's love. Americans no longer wanted to talk about sin, end quote. He also said that over the past two centuries, quote, we became very uncomfortable with the idea that human beings are sinners and we moved to just one half of the Christian claim, which is that God is love. Americans and everybody else, however, still need a way to figure out what I call the moral economy of stain and transgression, but the churches no longer provided it, end quote. That's true. Churches stopped talking most churches stop talking about sin and damnation and you know be saved or go to hell they they've gotten all that out because it's they want to bring more people in it's what the bible says just tickling their ears let them hear what they want to hear just to get the people into the church quote see oh you got to be kidding me no 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 no. i don't want to join you're going to make me pay for this Seriously? I don't want to sign up. Okay. I'll have to edit all that out for purchasing this. It was just a dollar. It's fine. So, St. Paul says this. The Christian claim is a scandal. Christ was an incarnate God who came to take away the sins of the world. Both are staggering claims, said Mitchell. Quote, so here's the problem. Human beings have this sin that only God can save them from. The development of what's called liberal Christianity was an attempt to be Christian and not be embarrassed by the scandal of the cross and the scandal of sin, end quote. And he also added, quote, when the churches disregard sin, you don't get rid of the idea of sin and guilt and unpayable debt. You relocate them, end quote. Part of the appeal of various 20th century social movements, such as those associated with civil rights, the LGBT agenda, and feminism, was their promise of a way to think about, quote, purity and stain that was no longer an option in the churches, end quote. Quote, white people, I detest the term, came to be stained because of the history of slavery in America. Black Americans and after them women, victims of patriarchy and misogyny, gays and lesbians, victims of heteronormativity, all have taken on the mantle of innocent victimhood. Conservative blacks, I should add, have long fought back against being called victims, but today in America, the only way you get a hearing is if you can wear the crown of innocent victimhood, end quote. That was also from Mitchell. He then said, quote, So when the Pew Charitable Trust notes that American church attendance is going down, I say, you don't know where to look. If we call religion institutionalized Christianity, well, then, of course, the numbers are going down. But if we call religion the search for a way to think through purity and stain, innocent victimhood, and historical sin in order to find atonement, then in America today, we're having a religious revival, end quote. I 
I disagree with that big time. Mitchell characterized the phenomenon underway as a, quote, great awakening in America without God and without forgiveness. He also said, we're the most religious people we've ever been because every single day people are getting up and figuring out whether they're innocent victims or whether they're transgressors, end quote. Okay, I, I was kind of on the same track with this man uh, halfway through. He's lost me. He, we're not in a religious revival. And we're not the most religious we've ever been. This popular system of ascribing guilt and assuming innocence, identity politics, is effectively a form of heretical Christianity that has become America's established church, suggested Mitchell. So adopting a term he indicated was previously used by Alex de Tocqueville, Mitchell suggested that when Christianity first began to falter, the consequence was not secularization, but rather the rise of a series of incomplete religions. The leading examples are the French Revolution, Marxism, the post-colonial theory that dominates the pro-Hamas student protesters today, and of course identity politics, which we see everywhere. Okay, so he says we didn't move from Christianity um, to a secular world. We moved from one incomplete version of Christianity, complete with the designated innocent victim and moral economy that says who's purified and who's damned, to the next. Identity politics is the latest iteration of an incomplete religion. Quote, we're living in a time of heretical Christianity. My argument is that Christians have been fighting heresies from the very beginning, and they battled and won against the heresies by asserting the claim that's the scandal to reason, namely, Christ was crucified for our sins. Identity politics, like the earlier incomplete religions, can only be vanquished if Christians reclaim their scandal, end quote from Mitchell. And he also indicated that if identity politics is left unchecked, then it will overturn the rule of law and has already shown signs of doing so. Okay, so maybe I am on the same track with this Mitchell guy and I just misunderstood some of what he said. Quote, I'll just use this example. You will recall the rioting, the summer of peace, yeah, the summer of love, most peaceful protest, and this was in reference to the BLM riots, right? And that inflicted at least $1 billion in damages, claimed the lives of between 6 and 20 people, left over 2,000 police officers injured, all right, continuing quote, while much of it was a violation of the law, but within the framework of those incomplete religions, these derivatives of Christianity, your actions are at the higher spiritual level because you're an innocent victim. That is why if you break the law, it doesn't matter. There's a higher spiritual economy that recognizes transgression of a different sort that can't, that law can't recognize. So you might be so you might be a so-called innocent victim and you know burn down a building, but you're justified in this higher spiritual economy because you have special standing in the spiritual economy. The spiritual justification sheds the idea of the rule of law that applies to everyone equally, because in these incomplete religions, everybody isn't equal, end quote. He also noted that it's already taken root in America, and it's a hierarchy of purity and stain, and it could ultimately displace equality under the law altogether. Now, while the current target of this regime appears to be white, heterosexual Christian males, he also indicated that the heretical incomplete religion of identity politics will ultimately move on to the next perceived transgressor until all options are finally exhausted. Quote, this could go on for hundreds of years. This is the beginning of something, not the end. End quote. And along the way, the incomplete religion will likely seek the extermination of its complete origin. Quote, heretical religions will always try to destroy the institution from which they came, end quote. Now, noting in an, an analysis of this trend, it's often sociological and concerned with material side of the equation, and Blaze News asked Mitchell whether he suspected one of the drivers here may be a manifest evil. Quote, I'm a social scientist who studies the 19th century. I'm a Tocquevillian scholar. I put great stock in sociological and political analysis up to a point, but my Christianity tells me that there are spiritual forces of darkness here that we cannot fight without divine assistance. African Christianity, in a way, has it over the West because in African culture, there's a deep awareness that there are demonic forces at work, end quote. So, okay, I, I definitely am on the same track with this guy. Without Christ, there's no rescue from the demonic forces. We have to proceed then in two ways. We have to do what we can politically and socially, but with the full understanding that there are forces at work here that are dark and that nobody will ever understand. And for that reason, prayer is probably equally important to anything we might do, end quote. Definitely prayer, prayer, prayer. Demonic forces do exist, and we are in a spiritual battle. 
While recommending an all of the above strategy, which includes prayer, reclaiming the scandal of the cross and the problem of the brokenness of man, and having church leaders get their houses in order, Mitchell told Blaze News that a course correction, quote, is not going to happen until people realize that fault lies within, which is the most astounding historical eruption into time. This Christian Hebrew thing that says fault is within. That astounding historical insight erupts into time with the, with the Hebrews and the Christians. The West is inconceivable without this eruption. We're losing that insight today, which means we are not becoming more secular. Rather, we are relying on an incomplete religion according to which fault is always external and which your sins are always somebody else's fault, end quote. So this is about losing identity and not belief, supposedly. Professor Mark Movesian teaches contract law and, relig and law and religion in federal courts at St. John's University. He uh, extra to serving as director of the Matone Center for Law and Religion. He's on the board of Cambridge University's Journal of Law and Religion and co-host the Legal Spirits podcast. Now, when he was asked whether recent polling reflects real trends under the way as it pertains to the dechristianization of America and the rise of the nuns, Mavosian noted at the outset that there may be some issues with the surveys, like low response rates, discrepancies between respondent definitions about religion, and with some equating their faith to a relationship with Christ. However, Mavosian Mavesian, whatever, indicated that the general social survey executed by the University of Chicago, which has a high response rate and is regarded as, quote, the gold standard for sociological research, clearly indicated a major increase in recent decades of persons indicating they have no religious identity, and these results appear to match up with the polling data from Pew and other polling outfits. So he said, quote, it does seem to me that religious disaffiliation is a trend. Now we have to understand what's meant by that. He said, it's not that these people are becoming atheists. The number of atheists who flat out say, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the supernatural, that number has been consistently in the single digits, like 5% and 4% for a long time. So that's not what's going on. Um, instead of necessarily rejecting God, Americans are abandoning religious institutions. Quote, we have to understand what's meant by religious disaffiliation. It's not a loss of belief. It's a loss of identity with a specific organized state. And he also said, checking out of these institutions, which were once part of American life, and it's becoming a broader trend. Now, when it comes to nailing down what exactly is to blame, Movesian indicated that there are numerous factors, not the least of which is religious intermarriage. Quote, if one parent is in one religion and the other parent is in another religion, which is quite common in America, the kid tends not to be in any religion because the parent says, well, you can decide for yourself what you want to do. And oftentimes the kid doesn't do that. I would agree with that. That's a big problem. That's why the Bible talks about not yoking up with unbelievers. So you need to be married to someone who has the same faith and doctrinal belief as you do. Um, the children of nuns, like those born to interreligious couples, they're also unlikely to pick up Christianity or another traditional religion inside the home. Now, other drivers of this trend include divorce, social media, the clerical sex abuse crisis, and the sexual revolution. In the case of the latter, Movesian indicated that some people have been turned off by religious institutions. Moral teachings, including, quote, my church is telling me that this is wrong. I don't want to be in this church anymore. Yeah, sometimes the church can uh, bite at you. When the pastor's preaching a sermon and it hits home, it can make you uncomfortable. But that's your conscience telling you you're guilty and fix it. Go repent. Now, when Blaze News raised the possibility that this may be just the latest bust in a long-standing cycle, Mobegian highlighted the example of the colonial period when the, quote, number of nuns would have been very high because there were not a lot of churches. This was a frontier society, and you just didn't have a lot of churches to belong to, end quote. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, he also says that rates of religious disaffiliation have been high in America before. And, of course, you know what happens at the end of the colonial period, the first Great Awakening. So, maybe we're due for something like that. I mean, we had two or three Great Awakenings in America. Maybe another one is coming, end quote. But he was not, however, overly optimistic about an inbound awakening. And when it comes to disaffiliation, the professor made clear that religiously lukewarm are the ones sloshing around. Quote, disaffiliation seems to be from people in the middle. If you ask people, how intense is your religious identification? Is it very serious for you? That percentage has not changed at all. 
That percentage, like 37 to 39% of Americans who say religious is, religion is very important to us. And that has stayed the same. Those who previously told posters that religion was only somewhat important to them now appear to be joining the ranks of the nuns. Quote, so you're seeing a kind of polarization right there. The people who don't care at all and the people who are very into it. That might be a sign that those people who are very into it, if they can make a push, they might be able to get some people back. It's not like these people are atheists. It's not like they just don't believe in anything. I mean, there may be some way to get people who have some sense that spirituality is important. The transcendent is important. End quote. And he also stressed that what the disaffiliated largely reject is, quote, authority, religious authority. Someone who says, okay, this is the way to go. This is the path. Now, while nuns reflexively reject authority and tradition, that is no guarantee against dechurched conformity. Quote, there are some people who will just go down their own path. Henry David Thoreau, right? I will find my own path. But most people aren't Henry David Thoreau. And most of us are middling people, and so we're going to receive something. We're not going to come up with our own thing, and a lot of what you see among the nuns looks sort of similar. End quote. Now, Blaze News asked Movesian about possible legal consequences of de-Christianization, inquiring further whether a recent study previously discussed may provide a hint. So, after reviewing various religious liberty decisions in federal courts, Gregory Sisk, a legal scholar and professor at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, and Michael Heiss, a law professor at Cornell, indicated in a 2022 paper that a decrease in religious affiliation may not inevitably be accompanied by a secularist opposition to acknowledgement of religion in the public square or the robust participation of religious persons and entities in public life, end quote. And he also said what they said is that judges who are nuns, they would expect them to be very strong on the establishment clause. They'd want to get rid of all the religious symbols on public property and so on, and Greg and Michael didn't find that. If you're a nun, you probably don't care that much about religion, you're just kind of checked out. So the idea that there's a cross on public property is not going to bother you terribly much, end quote. Movesian indicated that nuns in the judiciary may, however, be prickled by the perception of special treatment for Christians and for other religious Americans. While a handful of irregular religious judges have been indifferent to religion in the past, Movesian would not rule out the possibility that a de-Christianized America could be hostile to religious citizens, which it already is noting that even the seemingly laid-back non-judges alternatively care about exemptions afforded to those who, for instance, do not want to serve a gay wedding, serve a gay wedding on religious grounds. Quote, The fact that more and more people are unfamiliar with institutional religion, with organized religion, with religious communities, I think you're going to see more fights when it comes to religious exemptions, said Movesian. And as for Americans law, American law in general, he also said that, quote, Law follows culture more than culture follows law. So if the culture becomes disaffiliated and religion is not important to large groups of people, then of course the influence of religion on the law is going to be less, end quote. Now, Romstein. Dr. Ryan Cragen is a professor of sociology at the University of Tampa and the co-author of Beyond Doubt, The Secularization of Society. Now he suggested to Blaze Media in a written response that the, quote, massive religious decline, end quote, underway can broadly be attributed to modernization. Now, what he and his co-authors described and beyond doubt as a, quote, transition from a traditional rural non-industrial society to a contemporary urban industrial or post-industrial society, end quote. Now, while he generally credited modern ways of thinking with causing problems with religion, he also highlighted that general generational changes, clerical scandals, and corruption as factors for the decline in American religiosity. Quote, Younger generations are increasingly liberal and more likely to question traditional religious teachings, especially when these teachings conflict with modern values such as gender equality and LGBTQ plus rights, end quote. He indicated that perhaps more impactful than American youth pursuing paths of least resistance are the breaks in lines of cultural transmission. Quote, the real key here is that the transfer of religion from parents to children there has been a radical shift in how people parent their kids and that parents give their kids a lot more autonomy today than they did 40 plus years ago. Because kids have more autonomy, when they're asked if they want to continue to go to church, many kids are opting out of religious services. In many Western countries, the mechanism of religious decline is generational change. Yes, so you don't give your kids more autonomy. They are your kids. 
It is your responsibility to teach them and train them up in the way they should go, and he will not depart from it. Cragen suggested further that financial misconduct and sexual scandals within religious institutions have served to damage the credibility of organized religion and have likely served as a repellent. So, quote, I would argue that as religion declines, humans are returning to more human ways of living that don't involve the supernatural and human exceptionalism, he wrote. Uh, Cragen. So, Satanic, Satanic Temple co-founder Lucian Greaves did not similarly adopt a triumphant tone in his response to Blaze News, noting that the decline is, quote, at least partially a result of religion's increasing politicization, end quote, and emphasizing that, quote, it is apparent that religion can play an essential role in enriching, contextualizing, and guiding communities, end quote. Now, working under the assumption that, quote, religion doesn't make society function, end quote, Cragen noted that the decline of religion will not produce, quote, meaningful changes in donations to charities, volunteering, health, happiness, marital satisfaction, tolerance, kindness, valuing family, morality, etc., end quote. I would disagree. It is going to affect all of those things, and they will all go into decline like we have already seen. Cragen did, however, highlight a political impact, quote, the decline in religious participation has led to a weakening of the influence that religious institutions have over policy and public life. This can be seen in the increasing support for policies that conflict with traditional religious teachings, such as same-sex marriage and reproductive rights, end quote. There you go, a decline. In response to the question of whether there are stuff substitutes for religion, Craig and answer, quote, this is the wrong question. This, this assumes that religion is a core or essential part of what it means to be human or for societies to function. That is not true, end quote. That is true. Now, quote, religion is just one way people have found to accomplish some of the things humans enjoy or prefer, including explaining some aspects of the world, providing a community, giving people some moral perspectives, etc. But religion is not and has never been necessary for any of these things. In other words, nothing substitutes for religion because religion is not the default way of being, end quote. It is the default way of living. Absolutely. The Pagan Empire. Now, John Daniel Davidson, an Alaska-based senior editor at The Federalist, is author of Pagan America, The Decline of Christianity in the Dark Age to Come. Now, citing the, quote, wealth of survey and sociological data that we have built up over years, end quote, Davidson did tell Plays News that Christianity is indeed declining in America. And unlike past busts, which largely took place within the context of a highly religious and religiously homogeneous, homogeneous society, Davidson noticed that this decline long in the making has, quote, coincided with a kind of cultural revolution and societal transformation, end quote. Now, previously, Christian groups may have splintered off from one another, but this time around, Davidson indicated, quote, people are just kind of dropping out entirely, end quote. Like Mobegian, Davidson emphasized that the resulting nuns are not necessarily atheists or cold, hard materialists. In some cases, they are, quote, spiritual, not religious, end quote. He also said, quote, they are consciously disassociating themselves from formal religious structures, namely in America and the West, in Christianity, and instead are drawn to new forms of religion, which are really old forms of religion, paganism in a modern context, end quote. Now, Davidson did indicate that the neo-pagan ethos, which has come to dominate public life in America, quote, is a kind of inversion of the Christian ethos, which is to say a rejection of transcendental truth, of a transcendent God, of objective morality, or even of objective reality, an embrace of relativism, an embrace of subjectivism, an embrace of the divinization of the here and now, the eminent versus the transcendent, end quote. He also underscored that paganism, not secularism, rationalism, or materialism, which he regards as outgrowths or aberrations of Christianity, is the only real alternative to Christianity, and that this old and real enemy, quote, is coming back to fill the vacuum, refuting that humans are made in the image of God, that they have innate dignity and worth, and that human rights are an inheritance of Christendom, end quote. He also said, quote, so the pagans say all men are not created equal. They don't have equal rights, so therefore there's no need to have consent of the governed. There's no need for me to respect the weak, for example, because human beings are by nature unequal. That's why all pagan societies were slave societies across vast expanses of time and geography and culture, end quote. 
So apparently there's no basis for tolerance either, certainly not a violation of the public morality, which is distinct from private religion under pagan regimes. It is for this reason that those Christians who silently pray near abortion clinics in the increasingly pagan UK are hauled away by British police, he suggested. Now, contrary to, contrary to Cragen's suspicions about the post-Christian world to come, Davidson indicated that liberalism and its other extensions celebrated by secularists won't survive in the pagan empire. Quote, liberalism is going to go away. Its source of vitality comes from a Christian society, from a Christian worldview, and it depends for its coherence on that. So once it's cut off, you don't get the culture without the cult. Once you cut liberalism off from its source, it will wither and die. And once liberalism withers and dies, what you have is brute force, a society that's organized not around the idea of human rights, but a society that's organized around brute force, end quote. Now, Tocqueville, invoked earlier by Mitchell, indicated that the breakdown of religion would, quote, prefer citizens for servitude in such a despotic state. Tocqueville stated in Democracy in America, <clears throat> quote, when religion is destroyed among a people, doubt takes hold of the highest portions of the intellect and half paralyzes all the others. Each person gets accustomed to having only confused and changing notions about the matters that must interest his fellows and himself. You defend your opinions badly or you abandon them, and since you despair of being able by yourself to solve the greatest problems that human destiny presents, you are reduced, you are reduced like a coward to not thinking about them. Such a state cannot fail to innervate souls. It slackens the motivating forces of will and prepares citizens for servitude. Then not only does it happen that the latter allow their liberty to be taken, but they often give it up. So a silver lining in this dark cloud is that, quote, those who remain faithful Christians who are going to be keepers of the flame, so to speak, will become more potent. They'll become more powerful in a sense because there won't be any social benefits or prestige associated with being a Christian, end quote. That's from Davidson. Now, the beleaguered church, too, would be reduced to the faithful and the defiant. Now, according to Davidson, this campaign, pagan, this coming pagan empire's attacks on Christians may ulti ultimately be its undoing. Quote, Historically, the only thing that has broken the stranglehold of paganism over any society was its encounter with Christianity, because Christianity post posits a radically different way of seeing the world. It's from the similar but more... It's from the smaller but more potent faithful Christian community in the West, Christian church in the West, that I think the neo-paganism era that we're coming into now is going to be shattered, end quote. And though he suspects we're going to win, he also acknowledged that there will be bad times first and that the current generation may not see the earthly victory in their lifetimes. Nevertheless, it's incumbent upon them to fight for their children and grandchildren, quote, in hopes that they might be able to reclaim the Western Christian inheritance that was lost on our forebears. Now, Quote, find ground that you can win on and fight on that ground, said Davidson. And he also says, at that same time, you protect your family and you protect your church and you build up the community around you to weather the storm. But then you don't just keep your faith in those private spaces. You take it out into the street. If that means persecution, then so be it. Let's return to an era of persecution. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. End quote from Davidson. Yes, we must have to live persecution. It says that they will hate us because they hated Jesus first. And it does say, Paul says, that it's a joy to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus. So, really quickly, that was going to lead into this um, article from Louder with Prouder about Chris Pratt. God is real. The class of 2024 needs to listen to these nine pieces of advice from Chris Pratt. This is from Brodigan. Um, so this is talking about graduates in 2024. I'm not going to go over it. What I am going to do is I'm going to share the video of the nine things that you need to do. Now, this is something that's been around before, but here's the advice. And it's not just for the class of 2024. This is going to be for everybody. This is what I call nine rules from Chris Pratt, Generation Award winner. Number one, breathe. If you don't, you'll suffocate. <laughs> Number two, you have a soul. Be careful with it. Number three, don't be a turd. If you're strong, be a protector. And if you're smart, be a humble influencer. Strength and intelligence can be weapons and do not wield them against the weak. That makes you a bully. 
be bigger than that. Number four, when giving a dog medicine, put the medicine in a little piece of hamburger, they won't even know they're eating medicine. <laughs> Number five, doesn't matter what it is, earn it. A good deed, reach out to someone in pain, be of service, it feels good and it's good for your soul. Number six, God is real. God loves you. God wants the best for you. Believe that. I do. Hello, Number Chris seven, Pratt. if you have to poop at a party, <laughs> but you're embarrassed because you're going to stink up the bathroom, just do what I do. Lock the door. Sit down. Get all the pee out first. Okay? And then once all the pee's done, poop flush. Boom. You minimize the <laughs> amount of time that the poop is touching the air. Because if you poop first, it takes you longer to pee, and then you're peeing on top of it, stirring it up. The poop particles create a cloud, goes out, and then everyone in the party <laughs> will know that you pooped. Just try just trust me, it's science. <laughs> Number eight. Learn to pray. It's easy and it's so good for your soul. And finally, number nine, nobody is perfect. People are going to tell you you're perfect just the way you are. You're not. <laughs> you are imperfect. That's true. You always will be. But there is a powerful force that designed you that way. And if you're willing to accept that, you will have grace. And grace is a gift. Yes. And like the freedom that we enjoy in this country, that grace was paid for with somebody else's blood. Yes. Do not forget it. Don't take it for granted. God bless you. Please get home safely. Thank you. All right. There we go. So that's going to end it for today. I went a little longer than I intended because I didn't expect that Blaze article to be so long. I should have looked it over before I started reading it first. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy uh, having me back. If you wouldn't mind, please subscribe to the channel. Share the video. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I think this is something serious that we need to look at. We have a really big problem with our politics right now our country is declining we need to make it better and we need to vote in the right people to do so and we also more importantly than anything as christians stand up for the rights of other people go and share the gospel with everybody and let them know that jesus loves them and that they can be saved and endure the persecution even when it, it feels like there's no hope there is because once you're saved there's something so much better after this life. But do what's right in this life so that you can be told that you were a good and faithful servant. Thank you for joining me today. I love all of you that do support me. I really do appreciate. And special shout out to Scott because I know you're going to be excited that I actually put out a new video. So thank you. Everybody have a blessed day. And have a good rest of your week. Absolutely. And maybe I'll be back soon. Have a good day.